Hello, and welcome to the story of an endling, the last dialysine ever to exist. Enjoy. To begin, let's try to build an understanding of what exactly the word endling means. Terminarchs, or more commonly, endlings, are the individual living things that are the last surviving creatures of their species or subspecies, whose death consequently means the extinction of the entire species or subspecies. Well, that's a huge burden to carry. You are alone, child. <sighs> Author Eric Friedman describes endling as a word as, quote, a word with finality. Going on to say, it is deep to the bone chilling to know the exact date a species disappeared from the earth. It is even more ghastly to look upon the place where it happened and know that nobody knew or cared at the time what had transpired and why. In simpler terms, if you were a Terminarch or Endling, when you die, the whole human race would become extinct. No more friends, no more family, and no more internet, because you, you can't possibly run all those servers by yourself, can you? Not to distract from the subject at hand, but what do you think would happen if humans were wiped out? Would octopuses, or octopi, I can't remember, rise from the sea and claim their spot at the lofty peak of Earth's seafloor system. I mean, they already survive on land without water for about 30 minutes, so they're sort of pretty much there. Maybe that's what they've been plotting this whole time, who knows. Or would orangutans simply take over where we left off? I mean, they do share 97% of their DNA with us. Could be a Planet of the Apes type deal, who knows. Personally, I think orangutans are too dopey and silly looking to be able to claim the top spot. It could be chimpanzees, I mean with their smaller frame and extreme intelligence, I mean they, they could probably do a lot. I feel like they'd absolutely dominate other monkeys. They would probably employ gorillas to be their enforcers and bodyguards. But what happens when eventually the gorillas grow in intelligence and realise they can just take it all for themselves? What if we went through enough cycles and the earth went back into having a super ocean? You know how it used to be a super ocean and it goes in cycles being like a super continent like Pangaea. Yeah, so what if it went into the super ocean state? I, I think dolphins or killer whales would probably reign supreme. Although um, dolphins would probably be quite similar to our elite. Just loads of exorbitance and, and probably orgies sickos man anyway back to the matter at hand like i was saying an endling is the last animal of its kind before extinction and there have been a number of notable terminarchs that in the last century have gained notoriety for being the unfortunate bearers of the title endling we will go over one of those potratudinous animals and its stories today that is the reason we are undertaking this melancholic journey throughout the video together. Can you imagine what it feels like to be the last one left? The last one alive? Do you think you'd be able to sense it? You know how they say we're all connected? Do you think you would have that feeling of being disconnected? All alone? I wonder if there's a word for that feeling. The feeling of uh, the sudden realisation that you are the only one left. I guess conopsia is similar, but not quite. Weird there's not a word for that. I guess it is a pretty unique sensation. And no human has ever had to face it. But it does make me feel especially bad for the animals that have had to endure that pain.
For our first foray into the life of an Enling, we will begin with maybe the most famous of them all, Benjamin the Thylacine. But first, let's get some context. The Thylacine is an extinct carnivorous marsupial living in the temporal range of the Pleistocene to the Holocene that was native to the Australian mainland and the islands of Tasmania and New Guinea. It had the appearance of a medium to large sized canid covered in short fur, which was usually a yellowish brown color and a wolf like face with dark transverse stripes that radiated from the top of their back. They had stiff tails and both genders had a patch, with the females using it to rear their young and the males using it as a protective sheath for their manhood. Thylacines also had incredible jaws that contained 46 teeth and could open up to 90 degrees. For visualization, a dog is only able to open its jaw a mere 44 degrees. The interesting thing about the thylacine's jaw is despite the narrative that they killed farmers' sheep at the time, their jaws were very weak and only had the capacity to kill something as big as maybe a possum. Because of this misconception about killing sheep, the thylacines were described, according to reports from mid-1800s, as blood-sucking, cowardly, stupid and habitual sheep killers that were ferocious towards humans. In actuality, thylacines were timid and could be captured without any aggression and didn't have the capacity to attack sheep efficiently, so they didn't. So any attacks on livestock were incredibly rare and few and far between, with the more likely culprits being thieves and feral dogs. But sadly, due to this reputation, the Tasmanian tigers were seen as pests and the government bounty was decreed. Anyone who killed the thylacines were awarded a pittance by the government for their service. This practice continued and continued with the Europeans that had recently arrived in Tasmania hunting these innocent creatures until the time the government bounty was halted. But by then, it was already far too late. The last wild thylacine was shot in 1933 by a man called Wilfred Batty. <laughs> he apparently spotted it prowling near a shed housing chickens on his farm in Marbana, Tasmania. Unfortunately, that brings us promptly to the beginning of the story of Benjamin the thylacine. Benjamin, which in reality was not the thylacine's name, because she was a female. It was rather a name made up by a man called Frank Darby, <coughs> also a prick, <coughs> who claimed to be a zookeeper at the Bumaris Zoo, the zoo that held, um, for the purposes of this video, let's call her Jasmine, Jasmine the thylacine. Turns out, Frank Darby was not a zookeeper at Bumara Zoo because the last thylacine was in fact a female and when the zoo owners were asked about him, they had no idea who he was. Hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. A famous thylacine expert, Dr. Paddle, said, and I quote, it was a female, and it certainly was not called Benjamin. It is an unfortunate myth created by a bullshit artist of the first degree. He continued. What he has said is tragic, and it is time to remove it from the literature. Well, I for one agree with Mr. Paddle. Plus, I think Jasmine sounds better anyway. Jasmine was captured in the wild in 1933 before being delivered to the Bumara Zoo, 
where she continued to be until her last days. Recently, there has been some footage that was recovered of her time there. In the video, you can see a man rattling her cage, perhaps to get her to do something for the cameras. His name was Arthur Reed. Cough. Oh wait, I I'm, I'm meant to cough. <coughs> Another prick. <coughs> he was the proprietor of the zoo at the time. Randomly, during the same year the video was shot, Arthur Reed fell ill and died, resulting in a change of ownership of the zoo. Now, whether owing to the zoo's new ownership or just random negligence, one freezing night in 1936, Jasmine the thylacine was locked out of her shelter by a closed door, forcing her to fall asleep on the cold, hard concrete slab for the entire freezing night. The local paper at the time, The Mercury, wrote that the thylacine had been in, quote, splendid health and condition, but unfortunately contracted a chill during the recent spell of cold weather. On September 7th, 1936, Jasmine the thylacine was found dead in her enclosure due to exposure to the elements. Sadly, this came just two months after her species was finally given government protection. Too little, too late. The zoo posted ads offering to pay trappers for a new thylacine specimen, but to no avail. In 1937, the zoo shuttered due to falling attendance and the public began to realize the species had likely been made extinct. February 10th, 1937. An article in the Examiner of Launceston asks, has anyone seen a Tasmanian tiger lately? The article goes on to say that the government will circulate questionnaires to identify any sightings of the animals, but the species is feared to be extinct. Mr. A. W. Burberry said there was no reliable evidence that the Tasmanian tiger was now in existence. No confirmed thylacine sightings have been recorded since Jasmine's unceremonious demise, despite intensive searches and hefty rewards offered for convincing evidence. The species was declared officially extinct in 1982. Since then, the Australian government have revised this timeline to mark the thylacine as having gone extinct in 1936, when Jasmine the thylacine passed away tragically. Officially marking Jasmine as the endling for her species. A sombre title and a stark reminder that life, in all its forms, is precious but finite. Thank you for watching. This is my first ever YouTube video, so uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, I do have a TikTok by the same name, Zooisms where I post uh, animal facts and slideshows of lesser known animals uh, and just just general animal knowledge. Um, excuse me, bro. You're excused. And I'm not your bra. I literally just learned to edit, so the editing will improve. Um, but yeah. I, I mean, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm a big fan of educational content uh, and I've been watching YouTube since I was like nine years old or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm 21 now, uh, so I figured why not? I, I want to do something with my life uh, that I'm passionate about and uh, to be honest, that's, that's animals. It, it always has been. Um, anyway, I don't want to ramble on, so uh, yeah. Thank you.
Yeah, that's all, folks.